Hello, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome to you all on what's a particularly chilly day um, here in London. Um, I hope you are all well. Uh, my name is Terry. I'm the Membership Development Manager at the Energy Institute. Um, and I'm going to talk to you for the next 40 minutes or so um, to take you through the different membership grades offered by the EI, um, highlight some of the key benefits of membership, um, explain the process to apply for professional membership and registration, and also explain the specific requirements for our professional um, and chartered titles. And then that should leave around 15 minutes for questions uh, or Q&A session. Um, if you do have any questions at any point, um, if you pop them in the chat box or the Q&A function, um, I will read those um, and do my best to answer those questions um, at the end of the webinar. It is being recorded um, and will be made available on the EI's YouTube channel after today. And I'll be following up with everyone who has registered um, by email with a link to access that recording. So you can watch again if you need to, um, or you can share with others. Hopefully by the end of this webinar, um, you will have a much clearer idea of the steps you need to take to apply for professional membership and to get professionally qualified, um, or what you need to do to work towards that goal if you're not quite ready to apply. So without further ado, we'll get started. If at any point you do have any issues, if, 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 if I'm suddenly muted or you can't see the slides, again, write, write a message to me um, and I'll do my best to resolve those issues. Okay, just a brief introduction, um, a bit about the Energy Institute itself, in case you didn't know much about us. Well, we are a professional body um, and we represent the entire energy sector. Um, and our purpose is to bring together expertise to tackle urgent global cha challenges. So we bring together people, we bring together knowledge to help tackle challenges like the climate emergency and the growing global demand for energy. We are a charity um, and we're incorporated by Royal Charter. So we are able to offer chartered status to those working in energy. And we were formed in 2003 um, as a result of a merger between the, the Institute of Petroleum and the Institute of Energy. We have around 20,000 individual members um, and about 200 company members and technical partners. And we support all our members through our extensive branch network. So as well as our branches up and down the UK, we have branches internationally in places like Africa, uh, the Caribbean, the Middle East and Southeast Asia. And alongside some of these branches, we also have YPNs or Young Professionals Networks who put on a, a series of events throughout the year. If you want to find out where your nearest branch or YPN is, there's a link on screen there, um, so you can go online and find out where your nearest branch is, what's coming up in terms of activities, and perhaps you might want to get more involved with the branch committee. Our ambition is that energy is better understood, managed and valued. And in order to achieve that, we do a number of things, such as delivering training courses in lots of different areas. We put on events throughout the year, we produce industry standards and good practice guidance, um, and we do it by providing professional qualifications um, to those who work in the energy sector. We cover all sectors in energy and all disciplines. Um, and in many ways, that's what makes us a bit different from um, most other professional bodies in that we are industry focused. So you might be um, a renewable energy engineer, you might be a petroleum engineer, um, you might work for your local council as an energy officer. Your role might be all about um, making buildings, transport or operations more energy efficient. 
um, you, your role might be focused on tackling climate change. You might be a teacher or a lecturer in a university um, teaching about any area of the energy system. It shouldn't matter what your background is or what your discipline is, um, as long as you're doing the work that you do in energy, in the energy sector as a whole. If you are, then we'll be able to support you in some way. We'll find a membership grade for you um, and you, you may well be able to work towards gaining professional recognition with us as long as, of course, you meet the, the standards and competencies required. Okay, so moving swiftly on to our membership grades. So we have three introductory grades of membership. Um, on the left, in orange, we have student membership, which is for those who are studying either undergraduate, postgraduate, or PhD level, or you might be on an apprenticeship. Affiliates membership on the right in green is for those mainly who just have an interest in energy um, and they want to be kept up to date with what's going on. And in the middle in blue, we have associate member or AMEI. And that's for those who want to progress. They want to develop their careers in energy. They want to work towards professional membership and registration. Now for all three of these grades, it's very easy to join. Um, you simply go online to our website, follow the steps through, there's no assessment involved, and that will get you instant access to all our membership benefits and services. It's actually the best time to join, because um, from the 1st of October, membership is extended until the end of next year. So in essence, you get 15 months membership for the price of 12. And if you are looking to apply for professional membership, um, it's, at, it's actually the mandatory first step. You have to be a member with us before you can upgrade or submit an application, okay? So if you're listening today and you're not yet a member with us and your aim is to apply for professional membership, then you need to go online and join us as an associate member first. If by the way, you are uh, currently an affiliate member with us, still okay we'll still accept a, an application from you you don't necessarily have to transfer a cost to associate but just bear in mind that there are some benefits um, specifically tailored to associate membership and this shows our three professional grades of membership so we have fellow member and technician member now for these you can't join online you have to put together a written application of some kind if you're applying for member or technician member, it's looked at by our membership panel. And if you're applying for fellow, it's reviewed by our fellowship board. In summary, technician member is essentially for technicians. It's, it's for those who make things work at ground level. They're solving practical technical problems. They might not necessarily be um, leading teams or managing projects but they may be involved in the guidance and supervision of others. Member, MEI, is for all experienced, competent professionals that work in energy. Members are innovators, they are experts in their, their particular field, um, and they'll be working in, in a responsible role within their organization. And fellow is the highest grade of membership that we uh, can award. It's for the, the leaders, the influencers in energy, it's for those that drive the profession and really make a difference. For all three of these professional grades, you need to have a, a good level of, of a good knowledge of the energy sector as a whole. So not just your area, but the sort of wider energy scene. And for member, um, we would expect you to have a good level of leadership and management skills, both of people um, and of work. For more information about those three professional grades, you can go to that link at the bottom of your screen there. This is not the only membership journey to professional membership, but it's, the, it's a typical example. You'd begin as a student member whilst you're studying. Once you finish your studies, you'd upgrade to associate member. And once you have um, sort of relevant, sufficient experience in energy, we'd expect you to upgrade to professional membership 
um, or incorporated or, or chartered registration. A question we often get asked is, well, how many years experience do I need? Um, so we normally recommend that you have around four to five years experience in energy to be eligible for professional membership. But that's not a strict rule. Um, we've definitely had applicants in the past who have less experience than that, but were successful. And we've had applicants who have many more years experience than that, uh, but weren't quite ready to apply. And that's because it's less about time served in industry and more about demonstration of competence. If you can demonstrate the specific competencies for the grades and the registrations, then you are absolutely welcome to, to apply. That's, that's what's key. And of course, it also depends on the nature of your role, the opportunities you've been given in your job. Um, you might be fast-tracked through um, some kind of leadership and management scheme. And of course, you've built up those skills in a much quicker time. So it very much does depend on, on the individual. And this slide shows our professional grades and all the additional registrations that we can award. So in the middle section in blue, you can see that we're licensed by the Engineering Council to award Chartered Engineer, Incorporated Engineer and Engineering Technician registration. And we're also licensed by the Society for the Environment to award Chartered Environmentalist registration. And on the right hand side in green, are our three exclusive chartered titles. So you can't get those anywhere else or with any other professional body, only the EI. Um, and they are Chartered Energy Engineer, Chartered Petroleum Engineer, and Chartered Energy Manager. Now, In terms of what you can apply for, the sort of combinations of, of titles that you can apply for, you can apply for one of our grades on its own so you could apply just for member, just for fellow, for example, and many people do. And that is a form of professional recognition. That involves a written application, that involves an assessment of some kind. Okay, that is a way of formally recognising your expertise in energy. If, however, you wanted to apply for one of the additional registrations, let's say you wanted to apply for Incorporated Engineer or Chartered Energy Manager, you can't apply for one of those on their own. You have to apply for those together with member, with our professional grade of membership. Unless, of course, you already are. If you're already a member or you're already a fellow, then, of course, you can apply for one of the additional registrations on its own. It's a bit different with uh, Chartered Energy Engineer and Chartered Petroleum Engineer in that they have to be applied for together with Chartered Engineer, CNG. So just to take a step back, if your goal was to apply for Chartered Energy Engineer, you would also be applying for Chartered Engineer and Member. So that's three different titles, but crucially, it's one integrated application. We're not asking you to do three separate applications. It's one application only for all three of those titles. Um, but you will need to demonstrate two sets of competencies, one for member um, and one for, for chartered engineer. Engineering technician and technician member do tend to go hand in hand. So I hope that's cleared it up uh, a little bit. If you're still not sure, um, feel free to ask me a question by typing it in the chat box or the Q&A function, um, and I will, will try and answer that at the end. Okay, on to the benefits of membership, and I'm not going to, to um, list all of them or describe all of them. We need a lot more time for that. What I've done here is I've picked four benefits of membership that actually can help you specifically with um, applying for professional membership and registration or working towards that. So first of all, we have EI Connect, um, our mentoring program, which we launched in the spring this year. It's um, open to mentors, 
and mentees, and it's exclusively for professional members of the EI and associate members. So if you wanted to um, give something back, help others progress, share your own knowledge, then you could sign up as a, as a mentor. If you wanted to learn a bit more about a particular area of the energy system, um, then you could sign up as a mentee. But actually a lot of people sign up as a mentee because they're working towards professional membership or one of our chartered titles. And they want to connect with a mentor who has been through that process and can guide them through it. Um, and that is absolutely possible um, on EI Connect. So I thoroughly recommend that you sign up for that, for that uh, program. We also have an online professional development system called My Career Path. Um, so on there, you can log, track and record your CPD or continuing professional development. You can also create profiles on there against our um, grades and registrations. So if, for example, you wanted to apply for Chartered Engineer, you could create a Chartered Engineer profile and then it's basically structured against the specific competencies that we're looking for for CNG. So you can start mapping your CPD activities against those competencies, which means when you come to apply, you've made a massive head start. So it's a really, really useful tool. We offer training courses in a number of different areas, ranging from energy management through to oil and gas, um, risk management and environmental management. And as a member, obviously you get a significantly discounted rate to sign up for a training course. Um, and just to take one example, um, we have lots of training courses in energy management. Now, it's not a prerequisite to do those courses to apply for chartered energy manager status, but it can certainly help you demonstrate some of the knowledge and understanding that's required. So it can help with your application. And it's important to keep up to date with what's going on in energy, what's going on in the sector, what's the latest news, what are the latest technologies and developments. And you can do that by reading our monthly magazines, Energy World and, and Petroleum Review, both fully available online via our knowledge website, but you do need to be a member to access the full content of those magazines. You still might be thinking, why bother? Um, why put yourself, put yourself through the process to, to get professionally qualified? Um, and there, there are a number of genuinely positive reasons for doing so, one of which is it's a mark of your commitment to professionalism and best practice in energy. It's a bit like putting a, a stamp or, or setting the seal on um, your energy credentials. It's formally recognizing your knowledge, your skills, and the achievements you've made in your career in energy. And it also shows employers that you have the competence and the expertise and the work ethic that they value. So if you're looking for um, a new job, you're looking to advance your career, um, it's actually can be very beneficial to be professionally qualified. It can help you to stand out in what's quite a competitive industry. It also provides that external validation. Okay, we don't just hand out uh, charterships. Um, it's quite a robust process. Um, you're being peer reviewed um, by trained, established professionals in energy. Um, and that's quite impressive. That's something to, to, to shout out about. And it can also increase your credibility in the sector amongst peers and clients. And they are internationally recognized titles. Um, they do carry um, prestige. Um, they're not just recognized in the UK, they're recognized globally. And that could unlock some new opportunities for you that weren't open before. It might also have um, some financial reward to it, and there could be increased earning potential from being professionally qualified. So there are lots of reasons, and, and there, there are just a few examples. But don't take it from me, um, have a read what, what our actual professional members are saying. If you go to the membership page of our website and scroll down about two thirds, there's a carousel of um, member testimonials. So you can read what they're saying about why they joined the EI, why, how they found professional um, recognition valuable in their careers. It's well worth a read.
Okay, so moving on to the application process for professional membership then, which is probably the main reason um, a lot of you are, are listening today. So just broadly speaking, the first thing, let, let's say that you've, you've done the first step, which is to join as a member. You've joined as an associate member, or you're already an associate member or an affiliate member. The next thing you need to do is download an application pack from the membership page of our website. Um, on that page, there's a box for every grade and registration that we offer. Find the title that you're interested in, click on the box and download an application pack from there. And that pack contains everything you need to apply, including two sets of guidance notes. And I can't reiterate enough how important it is to read both sets of guidance notes before you start your application. One set of guidance notes is more general. Um, it's about how you approach your application, um, how you would approach the different documents that you need to submit, and perhaps what you can do if you're not ready to apply. The second set of guidance notes is, is a lot more specific. Um, it's related to the, the title that you're applying for. So if you're applying for Chartered Environmentalist, CM registration, then that, that second set of guidance notes would tell you about the standards that we're looking for, the competencies that we're looking for, etc. Okay, but make sure you read both before jumping in. You go about completing parts A and parts B, which I'll, um, I'll explain in a second. Make sure you proofread your application more than once, get your sponsors to check through your application. And then when it's ready, you'd send it electronically by email to, to that address, professionals at energyinst.org. And I'll tell you what happens after that um, in a few minutes time. So what exactly um, do parts A and parts B entail? Well, part A um, is essentially bringing together a set of documents to form your application. Um, and some are a bit more involved than others. There will always be an application form, first of all. That's very straightforward. Enter your personal details, career history, make sure you sign the form and make it very clear which grade or grades, plural, um, or title, sorry, that you are applying for. And the application form itself actually acts a bit like a checklist because it makes sure that you've included and attached all these different things. In almost all cases, you'll need to sponsor references um, and those sponsors will need to fill out a sponsor reference form, which you'll find in the application pack. Um, make sure your sponsors um, sign that form um, and make sure they add some detailed supporting comments on that form. Now, your sponsors don't need to be members of the Energy Institute. It's another question we often get asked. They can be members of any professional body, institutional society, as long as um, they are registered at an equivalent grade or higher to the one you're applying for. So, for instance, an associate member with the EI or an equivalent with another professional body wouldn't be able to sponsor you for a member and chartered engineer application, for example. They need to be, your sponsors need to be a, pro a professional member of, 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 of some form. They need to have gone through a peer review process to get their professional grade of membership rather than just being given it or, or joining online. Um, to, to gain it. If you're applying for chartered engineer registration, then one of your two one of your two sponsors needs to be needs to be currently registered as a chartered engineer. Again, not necessarily with us, the EI. The professional development review or PDR is um, like an overview of your energy related career up to now, giving us an insight into the the roles that you've held within energy, showing your progression as a professional over time. And if you look in the guidance notes, um, it does tell you how you should approach writing your PDR and what you should include. So have a read there. 
We'll need a CPD record from you, continuing professional development record. Um, and that's not only your CPD record to present, but also your future CPD plan. So how do you intend to maintain your competence moving forward? Um, there's a really good CPD guidance document on our, our website. It's called the, the Best You Can Be. It's very comprehensive. Um, and that's found in the uh, membership and career section and then click on CPD. Um, and one thing it explains is that CPD encompasses a, a very wide range of activities. It's not just a master's degree or a technical training course. Um, it could be doing your own research, uh, mentoring others, uh, listening to a webinar, going along to an event, okay? CPD, for CPD you can include so much that you might not um, be, be aware of. And you only really need to go back two or three years, um, picking the most relevant CPD activities that you've done. Having said that, if you did do something 10 years ago, um, that's, that's really important to you, that really supports your application, then of course you can include it. We'll need an organizational chart, just showing visually to whom you report and who reports to you, so where you sit within the organization. We'll need copies of your academic certificates and photographic ID. We don't need the originals, we just need copies, but they need to be signed by someone else. So your sponsor, for example, um, they need to be signed as, as true and accurate copies. And there's an application fee for um, that needs to be paid on submission of your application. Um, that does vary depending on the grade or, or registration. Um, but again, on the membership page of our website, there's a, there's a fees section and that lists all the application fees in full. Part B will always be the competence grid. Um, and you could argue that, that that's the most important part of your entire application. It's where you will need to show that you meet all the competencies that we're looking for, um, for that grade or registration. Um, and you need to do a competence grid for each title that you're applying for. So if you're applying for member and chartered energy manager, you need to do one competence grid for member and one for chartered energy manager because the competencies are different for those two titles. One thing you don't need to do if you're applying for chartered energy engineer or chartered petroleum engineer, there isn't a separate competence grid for those. You would just need to do a competence grid for chartered engineer and member. Um, but in, in the chartered engineer competence grid, you'll be pulling out your energy related experience, skills and achievements. There's a bit more on the competence grid coming up. This just shows broadly speaking, what competencies we're, we're looking for in all our grades. Um, so the A competencies are about your knowledge and understanding. The B competencies are about your application to practice, how you're how you apply that knowledge and understanding to your daily job. You'll be assessed on your leadership and management skills. You'll be assessed on your communication and interpersonal skills, as well as the E competencies, your commitment to professional standards, like our code of conduct, um, health and safety at work, CPD, that type of thing. But what happens with these competencies um, is that they are broken down further. So the A competencies are broken down and they become A1, A2, et cetera. And the same happens for B, C, D, and E for all the titles. So this is an, an extract from the MEI competence grid. So you can see the A competencies are broken down A1, A2, A3. And on the right-hand side, what you need to do is provide two maybe three examples of how you meet that competence, referring to your own experience, your own training qualifications, your own, um, the, the projects you've managed, um, whatever is relevant, you need, to, you need to demonstrate how you meet that competence. And the examples need to be quite detailed. Um, it's not just a, don't just put bullet points, you need to say, 
what you did to demonstrate that competence, and then explain how you went about it. What was your personal contribution? What did you achieve as a result? That's the sort of level of detail that our assessors will be looking for. Again, if you look in the guidance notes, the written guidance notes in the pack, um, it gives you some more advice on how you should approach the competence grids. This is another example, but taken from the CNG competence grid. Um, and what you can see here, it's a bit different in that we have provided some bullet points on the left hand side under each competence. So we're trying to um, give you some direction, give you an idea of the sorts of things you could write about when you're giving your examples. You don't have to. Um, it could be you, you might want to write about something that, that isn't included in our, in our bullet points, but is, is certainly relevant. Um, and don't worry about including examples to demonstrate all of those bullet points. You're not expected to. They're, they're, they're just there as a guide. You could pick one, maybe two of those bullet points and base your examples on those. Something we often get asked again is um, whether you can include the sort of same examples to demonstrate multiple competencies. Yes, you can. Yep, if, you, if, you, if one example um, clearly demonstrates more than one competence, then you can put it in more than once. Um, just, I, I suppose, my advice would be try not to do that all of the time. You want to show your depth and the breadth of your experience. So if you can pick different examples, definitely do so. And I can see some questions coming in, which is fantastic. And as I said, I'll answer those um, at the end of the, the webinar. So just a few do's and don'ts when it comes to writing your PDR and your grid. Always write in the first person. It's about you, not your team or your organization. It's about what you've done. Include a good level of detail, as I've said. And if you can, give some facts and figures. If you're talking about a project you've managed, tell us what the, the budget of that project was tell us how many people you led in that project team. Try to pick different examples, as I just mentioned. Um, and yes, you can include supplementary information, but only if it's relevant, okay? Don't forget to proofread your application more than once. Get someone else to check it, because don't forget you're being assessed on your ability to communicate. You can't submit your CV instead of a PDR. Um, that won't be accepted. Your PDR is much more than that. Obviously, don't plagiarize or, or copy um, from other sources. And you can't leave any gaps in the competence grid. Um, to, be, to, to qualify for, for the grade or registration, you need to be able to demonstrate all of the competencies. Um, you can't leave any, any glaring gaps. In the guidance notes, there is an advised word count. Um, so you know, try to keep to that. You can go slightly under or slightly over, that's absolutely fine. Um, but don't go way over the word count. Um, we, we certainly wouldn't recommend that um, because you need to be succinct. You need to make sure your examples are relevant. And again, you know, you're being assessed on your ability to communicate. So you should be able to demonstrate the competencies with two, three quite clear and succinct succinct examples. In terms of the rest of the process, once you've submitted your application, it's looked at by the professional membership team. Um, that's purely a vetting process. We just make sure that you've included everything that you need to, there's nothing missing. It then goes forward to our membership panel for a uh, formal assessment. It would normally go to two members of the panel, two assessors. And we do try to pick assessors who, have, who work in the area that you do or, or have done before. So they'll have a similar specialism. It's unlikely that they'll reject your application just like that. Um, what they'll do is give you really detailed feedback. Um, and if there are any gaps, um, they'll, they'll, they'll spell those out um, and they'll give you an opportunity to fill in those gaps, address any shortfalls, and resubmit with further information. Interviews are mandatory if you're, if you're applying for one of our professional registrations, so Chartered Engineer, Incorporated Engineer, 
chartered at environmentalist, etc. Interviews are not mandatory if you're just applying for member um, or just applying for fellow, i.e. one of our professional grades of membership. Um, but that's still at the discretion of the, the, the assessors. They might decide that they still want to interview you to explore your application in a bit more detail. And of course, remote interviews are possible. Um, we don't have to do them face to face. The next deadline to submit an application is the 31st of October. So that's under one month away, um, not too long. Um, one thing to bear in mind um, is from next year, um, we put a proposal forward um, and it's very likely that there will no longer be application deadlines from next year onwards. What that means is that you can submit your application whenever you're ready, whenever it's complete, any point in the year. We'll send it on to the assessors. And if they decide that, right, let's proceed to the interview stage, we'll arrange that. We won't need to wait until the next membership panel meeting, which traditionally has followed each deadline. We won't need to wait for that panel meeting anymore. We'll progress it to the interview stage and so forth. So we'll be able to turn around applications a lot more quickly. It will be a lot more streamlined um, and that's from next year. But if you're looking to apply now, the next deadline is the 31st of October. In terms of the interview, um, it normally lasts between 45 and 75 minutes. Um, the best way to think of it is it's a discussion with your peers um, about the application that you've submitted, about your career in general. Um, there's no exam required, there's no presentation required. It's purely a, a discussion, a question and answer. But one thing to bear in mind is, is, is always keep the specific competencies in your mind, um, because when the interviewers are asking questions, they're always looking for you to uh, just clarify how your answer meets those competencies, because it might not have been clear in the application itself. So always keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, so moving on to the last section, which is uh, the requirements for our professional and chartered titles. Just to start, you might not have known, uh, we do have a fast track route to member and technician member, two of our uh, professional grades of membership. We officially call it the professional registrants route. So to be eligible for the fast track route to member MEI, you need to be already registered as a, as a CNG, ING, or a CM, Chartered Environmentalist, with another UK professional body or Engineers Island. And you need to be able to demonstrate a track record of working in energy. To be eligible for the fast track route to technician member, TMEI, you need to be already registered as an engineering technician, an ENG tech um, elsewhere with a UK professional body or Engineers Island. And again, you need to show that you have relevant experience in energy. It's a quicker, more streamlined route. Um, there are a lot less documents to submit. Just need an application form, a CV, a copy of your photographic ID, and an overview of your experience in energy, which you include on the application form itself. So just to make you aware of it, even if it's not relevant for you, you might have peers, you might have colleagues, who are already professionally registered and working in energy. So they might be eligible for these fast track routes. Okay, so focusing in on the three engineering titles, uh, CNG, ING and ENG Tech, all three have an educational standard that you need to meet. Um, and you can see what that standard is on screen. It's different for all three titles. I won't waste time by reading those out, but basically what we'll need to determine, first of all, is whether your qualifications are accredited for CNG, ING or ENG Tech, whichever one you're going for, either by the Engineering Council or under any inter international agreements, such as uh, FIANI or the Washington Accord or the, or the Sydney Accord. 
if they're not accredited at all, or maybe only partially, then we have something called interim registration in place. And all professional bodies will have a process that's similar, but they'll call it something different. We call it interim registration. Now, the best way to look at an application for CNG, ING, or ENGTECH is in two halves. The first half is the foundation technical knowledge and understanding, which you can see on the right hand side there. Or in other words, the educational standard, the educational bit. The second half is your professional competence and commitment. Um, in other words, your experience, um, basically meeting all those competencies that we've been talking about. And interim registration is in place to demonstrate the first half, the educational bit. Now it's very straightforward to apply for interim registration. Interim registration. If you go to the membership page of our website, again, there's a box for it. Click on that and download the form. The form will ask you to list your qualifications, send that in to us and we'll do the checks for you. We'll have a look at the engineering council register. We'll have a look at international agreements and then we'll advise you on what you need to do next. If they are accredited in full, you can be awarded interim registration straight away, or you don't have to accept it. You can just move forward to the next part. If they're not accredited, then um, you basically need to fill out an extra form, an extra grid, which lists honours level learning outcomes and master's level learning outcomes. And you'll need to prove that you have this, the equivalent knowledge and understanding as someone who has done an accredited qualification, okay? So there's a little bit of extra work to do to demonstrate the educational standard before you can proceed to the, 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 that written application, the second part. Just to summarize for the three engineering titles, you need to meet that educational standard. You need to have relevant practical experience. Of course you do. You need to abide by our code of conduct. You need to commit to maintaining your CPD. Um, it's obviously a requirement as part of your application that every year we ask members, um, a sample of members to submit their CPD records. You need to join as a professional member at the same time, unless you already are one. And for CNG applications, you need to choose between chartered energy engineer or chartered petroleum engineer. Next up, we have Chartered Environmentalist, which we're licensed by the uh, Society for the Environment to award. You can see a brief profile there. Obviously, in the guidance notes in the application pack, there's a much more detailed profile. But our Chartered Environmentalists come from um, a variety of different backgrounds. Um, they could be um, sustainability consultants and researchers. Um, they could be directors. They could work in environmental mitigation. They could be working to um, tackle or spread awareness of um, climate change. So if that sounds like something you do, then Chartered Environmentalist might be a more appropriate professional title for you. And it's definitely growing in, in popularity. For Chartered Environmentalist, again, there's an educational standard. You need to have a relevant master's degree or equivalent. Um, if you don't have um, a relevant master's degree in, uh, in the environment or sustainability or, or something that's, that's appropriate, it doesn't mean you can't apply. You can still apply for Chartered Environmentalist, but you're, you, you'll have to demonstrate um, an equivalent. So you need to show that you've developed master's uh, level knowledge through your own academic learning, through your own qualifications, um, or perhaps through self-study or on-the-job learning. Okay, There are other ways to demonstrate that master's level knowledge. You need to have relevant practical experience like the other titles, um, as well as abiding by our code of conduct, you need to abide by the Society for the Environment's Code of Ethics. And again, same rules apply. You need to commit to maintaining your CPD and you need to join as a professional member if you aren't already one. 
And lastly, we have um, Chartered Energy Manager. Again, you can see a brief profile um, of a Chartered Energy Manager here. There's more detail in the guidance notes, um, but essentially um, our Chartered Energy Managers will be providing advice on uh, energy use, um, energy policy, energy efficiency. They'll know a bit about market supply. They'll be analyzing an organization's energy performance, that type of, that type of activity. So for Chartered Energy Manager, you need to have relevant practical experience. You don't need, there's no educational requirement for Chartered Energy Manager, but you do need to have relevant practical experience. The other rules are the same, abiding by our code of conduct, um, committing to maintaining your CPD um, and joining as a professional member. We're also, um, we've also been approved by the Environment Agency to award um, ESOS lead assessor status um, as part of your chartered energy manager application. Um, so that might be something that's of interest to you if you're providing energy advice in-house um, or externally as a consultant. You just need to make sure that you tick that you're applying for ESOS lead assessor status on the application form at the same time as chartered energy manager but you don't have to. Okay, almost at the end now. Um, so what are your next steps? So if you haven't already joined, please do so um, and start making use of all the benefits and resources that are available. Get more involved if you can. Update your CPD record as you go. Um, there's nothing more difficult than remembering what you've done in the last few years when you make your application. So update your CPD as you go, use My Career Path, our online tool, if you wish. Whether you're ready or not, download the application pack for your chosen title, read the guidance notes, make sure you know what's required and what you'll need to do over time um, to reach that goal. Is there an educational requirement? If so, we need to check your qualifications. Have a close look at the competencies, have a close look at that part B competence grid. Um, and at any point you can start doing a gap analysis exercise, start mapping your uh, qualifications, training, experience, achievements against those competencies. And you'll very quickly be able to determine where the gaps are and where you need um, some extra professional development or experience. And the biggest challenge is often finding the time um, put some time aside to get started with your application. There are plenty of avenues of support if you need it. Um, we have lots of written guidance notes, as I said, in the packs, as well as CPD guidance online. Talk to your sponsors about your application. Part of their role is to ensure that you are at the level that's expected. Talk to your mentor, which will inevitably happen if you are uh, registered on EI Connect. Um, and if you want to talk to the membership team, um, feel free to contact us either by email um, or over the telephone. And you can see the details at the bottom of the screen there. And that concludes the webinar. Um, if you're leaving us straight away, um, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found um, at least part of that useful. Um, and don't forget, it has been recorded, so you'll be able to re-watch, re-listen um, at a later date. If you're staying with us for questions, and I can see there are some already, um, just bear with me a couple of minutes and I'll read through those questions um, before answering them. But if you are leaving us, thank you very much for listening today.
Um, so a question here about the competency grid um, and whether there is access to uh, any examples of a, of, a, of a completed competence grid. Um, again, we've definitely been asked that um, in, in the past. Um, and unfortunately, we, we don't provide exemplars. We, we don't provide um, a filled out example of, of a competence grid. Uh, and that's mainly because it's a very, um, it's a very sort of individual personal thing. Um, what we've tried to do instead is to provide plenty of um, written guidance in the guidance notes in the packs um, to explain how you should go about completing that competency grid, how you should approach it. Don't forget all those bullet points that we included um, to give you some ideas of the sorts of things you could write about. So there's plenty of guidance there, um, but, but no, unfortunately, we do not provide um, exemplars of, of completed um, competency grids. A uh, question here about um, if you're an associate member with us, um, how long do you need to be an associate member before you can upgrade to a professional level? Um, well, there is no set time frame. Um, if, you, if, if you're ready to apply for professional membership, if you have the relevant experience, then you could apply straight away. You could join, you could join as an associate today and apply for professional membership um, tomorrow. Um, there's no set time frame on how long you need to be an associate member first. Um, but obviously what you need to make sure is that you download the pack, read the guidance carefully, make sure you're ready to apply by looking at the standards and the competencies um, that are required. Um, for interim registration, a question about if there's an application fee. Um, there is, definitely, um, but <laughs> shamefully, I can't remember off the top of my head what that application fee is. Um, all the fees have actually changed in preparation for, for 2022. Um, but if you go to um, the membership page of our website, if you scroll quite far down, you'll see a section um, on fees. So if you click on that, you'll be able to see all the fees listed, whether it's annual subscription fees, application fees, um, professional registration fees. Uh, it's all there. So my apologies, I don't, I don't know that off by heart, but you can definitely find that information quite easily. And a question here um, about whether you can ask some questions, seek advice about your application um, and not necessarily by email. Yeah, of course you can. Um, you can, you can, it depends who you want to speak to. If you want to speak to someone in the membership team, people that review your application initially, um, then yeah, give, give the Energy Institute a call, ask to speak to the professional membership team and they'll be happy to help. Um, it doesn't have to be by email. It can be over the telephone if you want to speak to someone. Um, and in, in the sort of penultimate slide there, there, there are other opportunities to seek advice, whether that's through your sponsor references, whether that's through uh, a mentor. But, but yes, we in the membership team, we're happy to, to help if you have any questions. Okay, so I've just moved from the chat box to the Q&A function. Now there are some more questions. Um, a question about applying for member and chartered energy manager. Um, so yes, you, your, your options are, so you can't apply for chartered energy manager on its own, unless you're already a professional member with us. So if you're already a, mem a member, an MEI, or you're already a fellow, FEI, then yes, you can apply just for Chartered Energy Manager. If you're not yet a professional member with us, then you need to apply for that at the same time. Um, so, so yes, you can apply for member 
and Chartered Energy Manager as one integrated application. Um, and within that, you'll need to demonstrate the competencies for the member, and you'll need to demonstrate the competencies for Chartered Energy Manager by doing two separate uh, competency grids. Um, and the specific requirements for Chartered Energy Manager, which I think I laid out in, in one of the later slides, um, you need to have relevant practical experience. There's no educational standard, like for, for, for Chartered Environmentalist and, and the engineering ones, um, but you do need to have relevant experience um, and you need to abide by our code of conduct. You need to commit to maintaining your CPD. Um, and of course, you need to, to be able to demonstrate all of the competencies for Chartered Energy Manager. That's the main thing to, to, to think about. Is there a difference between associate member and affiliate member? Um, so again, yeah, I think I explained this, but, but quite early on in the, in the presentation, so you might have missed it. Um, affiliate membership is for anyone who just has a, a general interest in the energy scene um, and they would like to uh, be kept up to date with what's going on. Whereas associate member is specifically for those who want to progress their careers in energy and they want to work towards professional membership and registration or chartered status. Okay, so if that is your aim, then you should join as an associate member first. Um, and again, um, there is the, the fees are different for those two grades. Um, and my my advice would be to go to the fees section of the membership page of our website um, and have a look. Um, a question here about a chartered environmentalist application um, and the sponsor requirements. Um, so you don't need um, to have one chartered environmentalist sponsor. Um, so, so neither of your sponsors need to be chartered environmentalists, basically. Um, it's obviously great if 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 they are or, or if one of them is, um, but if it's simply not possible, um, don't worry. It's not a it's not a mandatory requirement. But as I said, when I was describing sponsors, um, they do need to be registered at, at an equivalent grade or higher to the one you're applying for. So presumably you'd be, be applying for for member along with chartered environmentalist. Um, so you need to find sponsors who um, have are of professional standing. Um, they have a, a professional membership somewhere or with, with some other professional body. It doesn't have to be the Energy Institute, though. Okay, so the next question is from someone who is currently an incorporated engineer um, and they'd like to apply for Chartered Engineer. Um, is, is CPD considered? Yep, absolutely. Um, when you apply for Chartered Engineer registration, um, you'll st still need to submit your most up-to-date CPD record um, as part of that application. Um, and a separate question about your qualifications. Um, not one I can answer right now. Um, Jeffrey, so what I'll do is I will, um, I'll make a note of your question about MSC and, and, and units, um, and I will get back to you um, by email uh, separately. I hope that's okay. It can get quite complicated when we talk about uh, qualifications for, 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 for CNG. So I'll, I'll come back to you on that one. Question about CPD, um, are, is there a, a minimum requirement of hours per year? Uh, no, uh, we, we don't work on the hours or point system. Um, so no, there's no minimum requirement there. Um, 
but when you submit your CPD record, just have a think about, um, just go back two, maybe three years um, and just pick out the sort of most relevant, most important CPD um, that you've done that supports your application um, and the titles that you're, that you're applying for, okay? In that CPD form, um, so there's a paper form which you'll find in the pack. Um, what I didn't mention is that as well as listing your CPD activities and when you did them, um, it's really, really important to also say what you learned from that CPD activity and how you've applied the knowledge that you gained from that CPD activity. Okay, that's all included in the table on the CPD form. So make sure you, you add that detail as well. Okay, don't just list the CPD activities that you've done and when. Also try and explain what did you learn from it? How have you applied that knowledge since? A uh, question from Mohammed about the application windows uh, or deadlines. So um, no, the, the, the one remaining deadline this year is, is the 31st of October. Um, so that's your last chance, if you like, to submit an application for professional membership or chartership um, this year. Um, but as I said, um, the process is changing quite significantly um, in that from next year, there won't be deadlines, so to speak. So you should be able to submit your application at any point. Um, and then the process begins uh, without any sort of further delay. Um, you don't have to wait until another deadline um, next year. A question here about Chartered Environmentalist and um, the fact that you need relevant practical experience. Um, yep, yeah, absolutely. You do need relevant practical experience and you need to, to be able to demonstrate the, the CM uh, competencies. Um, there isn't a minimum number of years, so to speak. It's, it's kind of the same rule as with um, sort of our other titles and our professional membership grades. We recommend that you have four to five years minimum experience, relevant experience. But if you have less than that, um, but you can still comfortably demonstrate all of the competencies, then you can absolutely still apply. Okay, think about it less about less of time less about time served in industry, and more about uh, demonstration of competence. Um, a question here about whether someone could be an MEI, uh, chartered engineer, and um, Chartered Energy Manager, I think. Um, you could be, yeah, you, you could. Um, I don't think there's any limit on um, the number of title, professional titles you can hold or the number of chartered registrations that you hold. Um, I suppose just bear in mind there are factors to consider. There are annual fees. Um, the process might be a bit longer for you if you apply for all at the same time, because that's quite a lot to think about. There's quite a lot of different competencies that, that you'll need to, to demonstrate and, and include in your, in your written applications. Um, so there's no, there's no rule on it, there's no limit on it, um, but just think quite carefully about what you can feasibly do, um, what, what you can feasibly put together um, what you could consider is applying for, and some people do this, is applying for one now and another further down the line. So you could apply for just MEI now and then chartered engineer registration later on. Or you could apply for both at the same time. Or you could apply for MEI and CENG now and chartered energy manager further down the line. I think that's a decision that you need to think about and that, that you need to make. Um, a question here about qualifications. Um, I'll try and 
wrap this up shortly as we, we have overrun. And if I don't answer your question, um, I will follow up by email. So, so don't worry, I will try and answer your question offline. Um, question about qualifications, which are not necessarily from the UK, but another country, um, but you have plenty of working experience. Um, so it depends what, what title you're looking to apply for. Um, if you are applying for one of the engineering titles like CENG, then obviously we've got interim registration in, in place, which I, which I explained during the talk, um, which will enable you to demonstrate the educational standard if your qualifications from, from Malaysia um, are not accredited. It could be under an international agreement, um, and that's something we'll check. Um, but I guess the thing that you, the best thing for you to do, if you're not sure, is, and, you, and sorry, and just to, I'm not sure, but if you are looking to apply for one of the engineering titles, is to fill out the interim registration application form, list your qualifications, we'll have a look and, and let you know what you need to do. Okay, I think I'm going to end it there. Um, so thank you to, to everyone once again. Um, I really appreciate you, you listening today. Um, I hope you found it useful. Um, if you have any other questions, if you think of any other questions, feel free to approach us, give us a call, send us an email, um, and we will be happy to help. So all the very best, and, and we look forward to, to, to receiving an application from you soon. Thank you.